So I think that's really impactful. And I think like for anyone that's listening, like that is something you need to do because anything that you're doing, like if you are beating yourself up and just, you know, like, or, or not actually taking care of yourself, like you're, you're going to crash. Right. And I feel like 2016 was my crash. Yeah. And what happened no, to make a crash? 2017 was my crash. I did 27 jobs. I was gone 65% of the year. My parents lived with us. My wife was miserable. I was miserable. We were like, what are, what? All this revenue, like, what is it if you can't save any of it? If you don't have any of it, what is, if you're not seeing the person you like the most, like, what's the point of all of this? Right. You're not seeing your kids, your wife, your parents. Like, you're not seeing anybody. You're seeing, the, the flight attendants and hotel rooms. Like, yeah. what's the point of any of it? Yeah. And so I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I, I, I never pick up my camera again. It's okay. Welcome to the Photo Report, where we have conversations with the top photographers, creatives, entrepreneurs, and got Eric Kelly here with us today, who's an incredible photographer and going to be having a conversation about photography and life and balance and all that jazz. And so, Eric, hi. So Thank good you. to have you out Thank here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. So I'm good. super excited to be living in the mountains of Canada, the, yeah. the, the Canadian Rockies, which I flew over the other day. They're beautiful. was blown away. Yeah, insane. Um, so get, for people who don't know you, which I'm sure there's very few of you who don't know him. They all don't know me. <laughs> That's right. But like, what, what is your background? And I, and I want to know some of like, you've owned coffee shops, plus photography, plus you're a dad, plus that. So like, Give a, give a slight background on that yeah. stuff because those are the things I'm interested in. Why don't I start from the beginning? Give it to me. AKA the present and go back. Go, good. I've never done that before. So I own six, no, I own five chickens. I had six and my son and I- Ate one? one? Killed one, he died in my hand. Oh. Um, he was a chick and so we have five chickens. We I love had, chicks. We have one dog, we had two, but one died. We have some kind of relationship with death that we need to work out and that's okay. Um, so we have one dog. I have one wife, which I've only always only had one wife since I've had a wife. There's only been one. I have two children. I have a boy who's eight and a daughter who's five. Um, the first two weeks of my daughter's life were spent in the NICU. She had meningitis and pneumonia. I owned four coffee shops. I owned three coffee shops. I own two. I own one. Uh, that coffee shop life went from 2008 to 2015, the, December 31st of 2015, I said goodbye to all the coffee shops. Um, I studied photography at the University of Virginia. I walked across Nicaragua. I have photographed about 450 weddings. You walked across the entire country of Nicaragua? Yeah, so Nicaragua is shaped like a V, and I went across the bottom portion of the V. The smallest portion the of smallest the country. Portion. Got it. it. Okay. 200. So you walked across Nicaragua. Go on. I walked across Nicaragua. It's about Proceed. 215, <laughs> 20, 30 miles. And it took us 16 days. We oh, wow. raised money for a feeding center that fed 150 kids a day. That was part of a network of uh, eventually feeding about 150,000 kids a day in Nicaragua. Wow. Uh, I photographed weddings. I photographed sports. I photographed musicians. I photographed all kinds of stuff. I had ambitions of biking from Alaska to Argentina. And then I met my wife and was given the option to marry my wife or bike across the world. And I <laughs> chose to marry my wife, which I am great choice. super excited about. Who's an incredible musician, Laura She's Kelly, musician. if you want to check her out. She is awesome, Laura Kelly. L-O-R-A is her first name, Kelly like mine. And uh, we live in a, a small house in Charlottesville, Virginia with a fence and a screen porch that doesn't have screens on the bottom, so it's really pointless to have a fenced-in yard because our dog and our chickens drive, walk up the street. They don't drive yet. <laughs> One day they might drive. True. Uh, I've been to six engages, which is where we are right now, uh, and I've met some amazing people. I've gotten to work with a few of them, and I have totally loved shooting weddings since 2004. 14 years I've been shooting, photographing weddings, shooting weddings, photographing. Sometimes when you go to a wedding and you talk about shooting something, I photographed weddings. Like when I took this couple out in uh, Saudi Arabia, I took them out to the desert to shoot them. Yeah. Like you, you probably don't want to. Those say are the things. Yeah. Or when you're in the airport and they ask what you do, you say, "I shoot." I shoot people. I shoot people for a living. Right. I'll shoot your dog if you pay me enough. I'll you shoot got your a kids. Long lens. I'll got shoot a, your wife. You got a sniper lens. I'll shoot your wife. I'll shoot your kids. You'll steal my truck. It'll be a country song. Whatever. So, 
I was born, or I lived in, um, time out, I went to the University of Virginia from 2002 to 2006. Before that, I was in middle school and high school in Rockford, Illinois, which at the peak of um, the recession had a 25% unemployment rate, Wow, which I wanted to totally get out of in 2002. And so I went to the University of Virginia. 96 to 2002 was Illinois, and then I was born in 1983. I'm a millennial, genette, zennial, I don't know what I am. Yeah, I think we're in. probably on the cups of Gen Y, Gen X. Gen Y, Gen X, millennial. millennial. Like, technically, I'm a couple different generations. Uh, I was born in 1983. I have an older brother that we, we grew up in Indiana until 1996. I have a father who's going to be 80 this year. So I learned to save everything, to eat all of the food on my plate, to not waste anything. He also taught me how to do all kinds of construction, home renovations. It's amazing. a lot from my dad. Yeah. And I have baby, bo baby boomer mom, uh, who's 10 years, sometimes 11 numbers, younger than my dad. All right. And they moved from Illinois to Virginia two and a half years ago. Lived with us for a little while while I was photographing everything. I was gone 65% of 2016, and my parents lived with my life while I was gone. Rad. We can talk about that later. Yeah, we can talk about that. So within that realm, so things that I would love, like you, you shoot a really high level wedding, you know, in a high end event. How did you, how do you feel like you got into that space? And, and what, obviously it didn't happen overnight, but like, what is, what's that process look like for you and like sort of where you are now yeah. with the stuff you're doing? Yeah. So I have made a couple of charts and I've, I've got my pricing guide from 2011, 12 and 13 that I can readily access if I want to, to be reminded of where I came from. And I have made a chart of when I started in 2004, how many weddings I did, the price point that I was at. And that was like 2004 to 2006, 2007 to 10, 11 to 13, 14 to 16, 17, 18. And um, I, I hustled. I shot whatever I could. I shot sports, I shot music. I've met Taylor Swift, I met Justin Timberlake, I photographed Pink and met Ziggy Marley and photographed Tim Reynolds and all these people I photographed and I just did whatever I needed to do. My goal out of college was to make 100 bucks a day and I made two or three times that in my first year out of college and I did whatever I needed to do. I worked for a wedding photographer, I was fortunate enough to get out of college, get insurance, work for full time for a wedding photographer who taught me a whole lot, made me shoot weddings by myself while I was still doing a bunch of other things, trying to freelance together in my life. And um, I was shooting, you know, my first wedding was $500 that I split between another photographer and myself. Awful, 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 awful. I can't even, I don't even ever look at any of the photographs. Right. Uh, my second photograph, or my second wedding was in May of 2005 and I got stuck in the front of the ceremony, like crouched down, like not sure where to go, not sure what to do. I was just stuck, like crouched down, like a tiny little crouched down person, like. So at a certain point, it hurts the knees, hurts yeah, the hurts feet. Yeah, everything. My brother's photographing with me, and he is in the back, and I'm right there. Just chilling, the yeah. Of the front. So I shot a whole lot of weddings. I went all over the place. I offered myself for free to people. I met Lynn Easton in 2009, 2010. Um, my wife worked for a, a magazine called the Wedding Planner Magazine, of which Lynn Easton was the managing editor of, and they teamed up and did stuff together. I was able to come in and, this is really loud. It's unbelievable. So, sorry. They're tearing down and literally like throwing metal like pipes. Metal pipes, like they're jousting and Proceed. pole vaulting. Yeah. So my wife and Lynn Easton had a really great partnership working with the Wedding Planner magazine. I was fortunate enough to have a few of my weddings published, to photograph the cover of that, and figure out how to begin working with Lynn Easton. She has helped me tremendously throughout my career. I came to Engage in 2014. And I sat down to, at my... I think we were roommates that year? We were roommates that year? No, my wife was there. Okay. We met, we might have met that year. All right, probably. We were in Grand Cayman, 
And I remember standing on the lawn doing an artist report. <laughs> I was one of the first, I think. And so uh, that was my first engage. I had, I met a bunch of people. I had recently photographed Jessica Simpson's wedding with Elizabeth Messina as a second shooter with Mindy Weiss. And that was in July. And then in November, I was at Engage and I saw Mindy Weiss and she came up to me with big open arms. I never thought I would see you again. Oh. And that really was a pretty impactful moment for me. I then met Brian Raffinelli and I was like, I want to work with these people. Right. At Jessica Simpson's wedding, I realized that my sports background, I was a diver, I realized my sports background and my high pressure diving career lend it, lent itself perfectly to high pressure events. And I felt the most alive when I was photographing high pressure events. Right. When I had like huge weights on my shoulder and I had to measure up to these um, standards that had been set before me. So I shot that wedding. I met Mindy Weiss. I was at dinner at the diner around with Debbie Geller. And I said, I have left my schedule open for this to meet people like you because I want to work with you. And apparently I said something right. And she called me three weeks later and asked for a proposal. Mindy or Debbie? Debbie. And that particular job didn't pan out. She asked me for another job which was Iron Man's birthday, um, like Robert Downey Jr.'s birthday, which I lost to Joe Busink, which totally flattered by, I, I would, if I had to lose a job to anybody, it would be Joe Busink. It's a good one. He was amazing. And so that began my endeavor into what is engaged, what is, what does it look like to do high-end weddings, what does it look like to do like in high-pressure situations, and I met more people the next year when I went to Engage, and I met more people the next year, and I started getting jobs from these planners, and that has been my last four years. I've worked with a lot of non, uh, I've worked with a lot of people who don't have planners, and I really love working with planners the most, and I don't want to wait around for planners to call me, so I'm trying to be proactive and reaching out to them. I really want to have relationships with people and I don't want to just mooch. I don't want to just come across like I'm trying to get something because I'm not just trying to get something. Like I yeah. really genuinely care about people and appreciate having really relationships with people. And so one of the, my favorite things about coming to engage where we are right now in Banff, Canada, Banff, Banff. I always want to say Banff, like Bam. Yeah. But it's Banff. Anyway. Uh, I really like to meet people and hang out with people and connect with them and have real relationships with yeah. them. So I think that part of what has helped me is me being myself and my personality and people really like me. Um, on wedding days, around high pressure things, I'm able to rise to the occasion and not add stress to the day. So um, I'm working every day to try to figure out how to do better. When I was a diver, my coach, the first thing he would say, great job, now fix this. Great job, now fix this. My wife, when I would go shoot a wedding, she would say, this is awesome, fix this. So I was, I was trained to be receptive and open to yeah. critique, not criticism. I view it as cr critique, not criticism. If somebody is trying to help me and encourage me or tell me that they're not quite sure that I should do it the way I did it, uh, I don't look at that as negative. I look at that as a positive for the future. So yeah. I'm really open to um, encouragement is what I look at it as. And so that became my wife. Like she would encourage me and help me. And then I would hear that from others. And so all of these things have helped me get to where I am today. Yeah. I've been in the right place at the right time a few times, but I've worked really hard and tried to make the most of the relationships and the opportunities that I've had. And I think all of those things combined make up the suit that is where I am. Love that. And so within that journey, when, when did you start, because you shoot film, uh, when did you start bringing film into the mix? Yeah. So, and why? So I am a huge believer in the Enneagram. If you have what number are you? I'm a three, the achiever. And I thought I was a helper. The two people put me at the seven, which is the enthusiast. I was like, I don't want to be the enthusiast. I don't like, I want one thing. And so I've recently come to the realization, the owning of being a three, the achiever. And 
one of the things that I've always done, not just with weddings, so this is a long way to answer my question, your question about where I kind of, um, how I kind of got into film and where I'm at, the, traje the trajectory that I've been on. I went to the University of Virginia. I looked for schools where I could dive, where I could not be the best, where I could strive towards something. Um, and maybe that was something other than trying to strive towards something and maybe not wanting to be the center of attention and the best on something. It's, it's, it's neither here nor there. But I was always looking at the competition. I was always looking at those out there that were doing similarly but better than me. Mm -hmm. My perception was that they were doing better than me. And so I, I saw this photojournalism swing in 2002, three, four, at the, 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 the beginning, the dawn of digital photography and especially weddings, and the digital wedding photojournalist was born in the late 90s, early 2000s, when digital cameras, you can spray and pray and just take thousands of images. Oh, right. Everybody thought they were a photographer. And so I was trying to, I realized in late 2008, 9, 10, that I was missing something, and that was me bringing my skill of the fine art, the, the, the beautiful um, portrait and the composition, I was missing that because so many people were pushing back on Olin Mills and the Post portrait, that they just wanted photojournalism. And I realized that I was missing something, that I was, I was not delivering to my clients exactly what I wanted, and I realized that I needed something else. My wife and I found film photography, and the, um, some of the top photographers in the, in the world at that point, and we started analyzing them and seeing what they were doing and how we could not copy them, though you sometimes need to copy the masters, and that's okay. Yeah. But how we could uh, analyze them and learn from them and incorporate some of what they were doing and what I was doing. So I made a shift in 2010 from just shooting digital photography to shooting some film. And in late 2010, I shot, no, it was, it was late 2012, I shot a wedding, actually did video at a wedding with Jose Villa. Mm. I was doing video and I was able to see him work and it blew me away and it wasn't that dissimilar from what I was doing, but it affirmed what I was doing and that I wasn't doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I then photographed the best wedding I've ever photographed the next weekend with Lynn Easton in Charlottesville, which was published five or six times, blew her out of the water and she was totally appreciative of mm. what I had done for her. And I made zero dollars on that wedding because I spent so much money on the film, but I learned how to shoot over the last, the, the previous couple of years and was realized that I just needed to do whatever I needed to do to get the job done. Yeah. And so at that point I realized, just do what you need to do. Don't worry about what it's going to cost you. Don't worry about anything. Just do it. And don't be, you know, a dollar twenty-five, dollar fifty per image. Just like digital costs you the same amount. It's just not all money. It's right. time. So. That was kind of the beginning of my, my digital film combination. There were some weddings that I photographed only film the next few years. There were some that I only photographed digitally. And I now think, what's any given situation going to require? What My tool belt is full of the best tools out there. Yeah. In any given environment and situation, I have the best tool for that particular moment. And so it's really important for me to look and analyze what, where I am, what I need, and do that, whether it's mm -hmm. on film or on digital, because my clients are who I'm there for, mm -hmm. the planner, I'm there for the, what, the bride, the groom, the family, the well, whoever it is, I'm there for them, not me. Yeah. So if I need to put my art aside to be able to do the job to the best of my ability, that's where I'm at. Yeah. And I mean, I, a lot of times, like a lot of couples who will talk with me, like they sometimes know the difference between film and digital, and most of the time they don't. And so then it's asking, like, why film? And say, listen, it's a tool. You know, it's like, in, in this situation, I feel like it's going to look the best. But digital is an incredible tool in low light, where yeah. film can't really get there. Yeah. But, like, as a tool, so you have this, what you described, like, this tool belt. So for each occasion, you're using those different things. Yeah. And so versus just being, like, stingy, like, I'm exclusive this. That's all that I'm doing. But um, yeah, I, I do. I think it's a tool as well, and it's great. Yeah. I mean, but. I shot a wedding for a client whose name I can't say, who is a high-profile figure, and 
it was in New York City, it was in a hotel, and then an indoor stair, like indoor event. And I was afraid that it was going to rain. It actually was going to rain. I went and bought a medium format digital camera the day before the wedding, and I shot the entire wedding on a brand new digital medium format camera. I shot four rolls of film. Yeah. And I didn't even use them. I didn't even deliver to the client because it didn't work. Right. And so I'd, I don't know what I would have done had I not like had that forethought, had that foresight to say, I have to Film's deliver not an work. exceptional yeah. Like, yeah. product to this client. And I can't let my art, my desired way of doing things get in the way of what I deliver to the client. Yeah. So, I mean, being, being at this higher level, like a lot of people would kill to be like, shooting the weddings you're shooting and doing what you're doing, which is like you do incredible work with incredible planners and this high level profile. Like what, what is still hard? Like what, what are challenges? And you're also like a husband, you've got a family, all these sort of things, but like what are the things that are still hard? And I think, I mean, we've had these conversations uh, off camera, you know, about this element of also like being at this platform stage of your life. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I think so often people are viewing just the glory, just the glamour, just what's seen on Instagram. But like, I really care about sharing, like, but what's, what's still hard, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I would start by saying I've done a whole lot of work on me personally the last year. What's like that mean? Psychiatrist, counselor, medication here, there, work on my story. Big T trauma, little T trauma, what that means, how What old, is big T, what's little T? Big T trauma would be you were... You Something. You suicide. Okay. You were raped. You were molested. Little T would be your uncle said something to you or your, like somebody said something to you that... They affected you, you in a way, yeah. affected you, right? Your dog dying would be a, a little T trauma. Got it. Unless you killed your dog. Like that would be a big T trauma. Yeah. Like, or unless you watched your dog... If you watched your dog get hit by a car, and then, like that would be a big T trauma if you Got were it. a little... Like yeah. Probably yeah, 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 yeah. An older person too. Right. So there, there are big. There's big T trauma, little T trauma. I, I have little T trauma in my life. Maybe there was some big T trauma too. I've been working on trying to understand how that's impacted my life. Yeah. What this particular situation when I was four? How did that impact the rest of my life? Yeah. So story work and going back into and digging into what my life has been like, what's happened in my life, giving myself grace for the you know the next 30 years after I was four, um, working into the, like getting deep into who I am and how those things have affected me. So the last year I've spent a lot of time with a counselor, talking with my wife, talking with my friends. And, and, and a year ago, that counselor asked me, how present would you say your wife would say you are? And I said, without hesitation, 20%, two, two, on, two out of 10, without hesitation. And I was blown away by my answer. Nobody wants to be 2% pre or 20% present. Yeah. Nobody wants to be a two out of 10 on anything. And so that was a huge question that that person asked me. And so I've spent a lot of time in the last year trying to understand why am I at 20% present when I'm home and whether it's lack of boundaries or this or that, I think it's, it's been important for me to understand that a little bit more. A month ago, I sat down with him and I said, I'm 80% present when I'm home. So why, why do you think you're 20% and what has brought you to 80%? I didn't know myself. I wasn't that self-aware. I was not, I had not done enough work on myself to understand myself. Some people know themselves really well and right. know what they want, know what they need, know all kinds of things about yeah. themselves. They can get up in the morning, they can go run. And they can exercise, they can do these things. Yeah, go ahead. So with the Enneagram, for those of you that don't know the Enneagram, check it out. Like, you could look at, you know, the, you're a seven? She's a seven over there. She is the enthusiast. All right. My wife so, is an enthusiast. But if you don't know the Enneagram, it, it is, I, like, yeah, there's all these, like, self-help tests you can do. But the Enneagram, I feel like, what it does is it highlights your weaknesses so you can work on them. Versus, like, just saying you're hardwired this way. It's like, no, these are your tendencies. Yeah. And as the, I'm also a three, that leans really hard towards the two. Three is the achiever, two is the helper. Yeah. And, but four, with, four is the artist. And when your number, you generally have some aspects. Wings. You have wings. They're considered wings. Aspects of the two or the four if you're a three. So, yeah. 
But, but with the three as the achiever, what happens is you, you're incredible at being what you think you need to be to be liked and being what you, you're performing, you know, you're a performer. So you are putting on this face that you feel like you need to be to be successful in whatever range, whether, I mean, like, I, I was to the degree, I was helping a friend, I used to be in commercial real estate, and like I was making a connection to help a friend sell a $15 million building that was his dad's property, and I was bringing in this builder, and I literally was flipping, like, and what's funny is this friend knows the Enneagram, and he, like, that I just described to him, was like, I actually, I, I had so much stress, like, knowing how to dress, because I didn't know who I was going to be for that event. It was, am I, like, a real estate broker? Am I a photographer? You know, like, those sort of yeah, things. Yeah. But, but I think that plays into, like, you being a three and being this achiever, not being very self-aware, because I think a lot of that lack of self-awareness comes from you not really thinking of what you need or, like, why you are who you are, and always putting on the face yeah. that you need to put on so that people will receive you or like you. Yeah, right? and I think for a little while, I thought I was too, the helper. Same. Not taking care of myself and taking care of people before myself. Yeah. And when I was a two, I had huge revelations of like, I need to put on my oxygen mask before I put on the next person's right. oxygen mask. And then I got into it more. I listened to Sleeping At Last. Okay. Like you've listened to the, this guy has made songs. He's gone up one through five and he's making songs for each Enneagram number. And you should just play that song on this thing that we're doing because that song is me to a T. And it was the most enlightening, most enlivening thing for yeah. me to hear and understand me and where I was. And so, yeah, rising to the occasion, putting on whatever mask I needed to put on didn't really ever help me be me. And so the last year I've been focusing, how can I take care of me? My wife a few months ago said to me, you look and feel like you are the most comfortable in your own skin that I've ever seen. It's amazing. And that was a huge help for me. Yeah. So having her say that to me was hugely influential to me and affirming of the work that I'm doing on myself and where I am. I, you know, people have asked me, what's, what's been your most favorite engage? And I feel like this one's my most favorite engage, which is weird maybe to know that right off the bat, mm -hmm. but I feel the most like me. Yeah. I know that I'm not performing for anybody. I'm having a good time. I'm lively, I'm having fun, but I don't feel like I'm trying to be somebody that I'm not. I think, I think probably in the earlier years of being here, the earlier years of starting, but there's a desperation of like, Want, I, again, probably wanting to be liked, but then also wanting to be hired, you know? Right, so there's right. there's a desperation, and, and I know that sure, feeling, sure. versus now being like a prominent person in the mix of the family yeah. that is engaged. And I feel like I'm in the family, and I had dinner with Jose and Joel and a few other people a few years ago, and I said, I feel more included in this group of people than mm. any other group in my life. And being raised in a conservative family, what do I think about anything in the world today? Like, I didn't even know how to answer any questions. And I feel like that was okay when I came to a space like this. And being around people that are different than me, same as me, um, darker than me, lighter than me, whatever it is, uh, this has allowed me to see people for who they are. And I feel like I'm able to be seen as me. And I, even more now, I, I, I don't feel like I'm performing. I don't feel like I'm trying to win somebody sure i want to get work but i'm i've had more of a shift toward long-term perspective than short-term gain and i think that you take steps every day and you're going somewhere i think i don't remember where it was but somebody said i don't have dreams i have goals oh it's harvey specter from suits the show suits yeah megan markle was on this show and totally loved megan markle in the show <laughs> now she's what is she a Princess, Duchess, whatever she is. Yeah, right, anyway, yeah. I love it. And Harvey Specter in the show is like, I don't have dreams, I have goals. And I realized that that was me. Uh, and I think that that's been really helpful for me to see, like, I don't have dreams, I have goals. Like, I want to go somewhere, I want to get something done. And it takes a long time sometimes to achieve those goals. So what, like, with goals being, obviously I know, like, when you're first starting out, you have these goals, like, maybe getting hired or working with these people, but being at the level you are, being, you know, 12-ish years in, 
like what are the goals you're now setting for like like what do you do it's like you've got a few kids you've got a couple kids and you know you've been doing this for a while we're getting older you know like that element but like so what is what is that long game what are the goals that you're still setting for yourself yeah i think that one is i want to take better care of myself i want to be more self more self-aware of myself i want yeah. to be able to get up at seven in the morning or six in the morning and go for a run on my own and not rely on other people i want to be able to do work that not only gives me life but delivers something like a great product to my clients I want to. I want to work with. I still want to work with Mindy Weiss and Debbie Geller and Brian mm-hmm. Rapinelli and mm-hmm. the best of the best. Right. I want to position myself around people that are better than me. Whether their whole life is better than me, I'm not talking about that. But like in in an industry in a career path, uh, I own my own business. I can't move up in my own business, but I can sure move up in pricing in quality from. A to Z of what I'm delivering to my clients, the experience that I'm able to deliver to clients and planners and everybody. So I I I think that I'm really trying to trying to work with the best, and I want to be I want to be the best. I think that it's important for me to have a goal of shooting some of the best weddings, not to gain notoriety or stature, but because I really like high profile or high pressure places. Yeah, I feel like those are going to be the most life-giving for me and so i'm going toward getting more that makes sense. no it makes total sense i get it and then so looking through just where what you've learned and i think the self-realization is major and i think it's really important for anyone especially like if you lean towards that like achiever three and a lot of i would say a lot of entrepreneurs end up in that realm i think we're not very self-aware of the way that we're like neglecting ourselves and so I think that's really impactful and I think like for anyone that's listening like that is something you need to do because anything that you're doing like if you are beating yourself up and just you know like or or not actually taking care of yourself like you're you're going to crash right right and I feel like 2016 was my crash yeah and what happened to make a crash 2017 was my crash I did 27 jobs. I was gone 65% of the year. My parents lived with us. My wife was miserable. I was miserable. We were like, what are, what? All this revenue, like, what is it if you can't save any of it? If you don't have any of it, what is, if you're not seeing the person you like the most, like, what's the point of all of this? Right. You're not seeing your kids, your wife, your parents, like, you're not seeing anybody. You're seeing the, the flight attendants and hotel rooms. Like, yeah. what's the point of any of it? Yeah. And so, I was like, I'm done, I'm done. I, I, if I never pick up my camera again, it's okay. I will figure something else out. And I tried this and I tried that and I pursued this a little bit and this a little bit and tried this and that and I took the summer off. 2017, I didn't do anything. Photography was. Didn't answer emails, didn't go shoot anything, didn't take my camera out. And I said to my wife, if I don't pick up my camera again, it's okay. And there's a photographer out there who, his name is Chris Burkhard. He's got a small Instagram following. Small three, four million followers. And here's what happened. I was, uh, I was, I finished this story workshop with Dan Allender in Seattle. Flew home, took a red eye home. And I got home just in time to go to friend's house, to a friend's house for the eclipse, to watch the eclipse total solar eclipse. And I took a few pictures, loved getting to experience that with my family. Went on Instagram, saw some stupid sick photos of the eclipse that Chris Burkhardt had taken. It's like, why am I not doing anything for myself? I'm not doing anything photographically for myself. And two weeks later, I went and shot a wedding in Napa. Happened to be in San Francisco on the hottest day in history. And did a wedding in Napa that at 117 degrees. Had the most fun of any wedding I photographed in recent history. And loved it, loved it, loved it. And came home. And that was the beginning of my, like, just getting back, like, kind of re-inspired back into photography. Two weeks later, three weeks later, I went and I shot a wedding in Aspen. And it snowed on top of Aspen Mountain on September 23rd, 2017 an early snowfall 
while I was shooting the wedding. Like literally snowing while we were doing portraits. Stopped just in time for the ceremony. The sun broke out. The sun was coming through the trees onto the ceremony site. Totally in love with everything that I was doing. Inspired beyond anything. The sunset was amazing. Snapped a few different photographs. Because of Chris Burkhardt, I went to Maroon Bells that night, a mountain, two Twin Peaks with a lake in front of it. I was like, I need to take this photo. It's going to have some snow on the mountain. There's no moon. There's not going to be any light leak from any light, no light pollution. And I made a photograph of this mountain. And the people that I knew, the people that knew me were so affirming and life-giving to me because I posted this photo. And they're like, why would you do anything else? Like, this is what you were made to do. You need to do this. But like, it makes me emotional a little bit right now thinking about that. But that was my, my greatest fear as a three is to be unwanted and in love. Yeah. And not worthy. Right. And to be able to hear that from friends pushed me into, I feel like, the most healthy space that I've ever been in. And I got home from that uh, wedding in, in Aspen. And I said to my wife, babe, I'm, I'm going to dive back into this. I'm going to go back into weddings. I'm gonna... I still had weddings last fall. But I was, I, I was ready to do it. And... I booked a ticket to New York to go to the Knot Gala. I called Catherine from Engage and I said, can I come to Venice? And I went to the Knot Gala and I saw some people that I knew that I hadn't seen in a while. And somebody there was like, I was, I applied for 30 jobs and had 20 interviews and nobody would hire me. And we had, we had a similar ish mm -hmm. story. That was affirming to me that I'm not the only one feeling the way I felt. I went to engage, was able to talk with Brian Raffinelli and really was like, you need to focus on you. And like, you, sometimes you need to get small to get big. And I went on the plane to come home. And because I analyze and I, I, I'm intuitive and I watch other people and what they're doing, I had seen some people responding to emails and writing and doing this. I got on the plane. I slept for the first hour, I had a bite to eat, and I got on the internet and I wrote emails for seven hours. I went from 250 emails in my inbox to 25 emails in my inbox. As a result of doing all of that, I booked six jobs in the next two weeks. Over the next two months, I booked 16 jobs for 2017, 2018. And hugely affirming to feel like I was doing the right thing. And so, I was thinking about Enneagram. I booked a couple of trips. I booked a trip to Ecuador with my wife. I booked a trip to Spain and Portugal for myself just to go and like get away and not do work for a client, just to do work for me. Or just to play or just to rest or just to relax. And then just to hang out with my wife. And we took two friends with us. And we had an amazing experience in Ecuador. And my wedding started in March 17th. And I've been going nonstop for the last April, May, June, three months, nonstop. I have had one weekend off, really, since then. And I have a whole lot of work to do to finish up these weddings from the spring. But I feel alive and energized. And I come to a place like this, and people are like, oh, I know, I know you, or I, I've heard of you, or hugely affirming, not making my head big, but just like, oh, okay, what you're doing is being perceived well and like accepted and like you're not crazy and you're doing a really good job. And so I have goals to keep growing and keep doing better and honing in on my, my craft and my skill. And one of the things uh, that the Enneagram song from Seeking at Last talks about is being a force to be reckoned with. Mm. And I'm, just, I'm really excited for you to hear it because it's really good. And I, my wife had it on repeat for an entire day the other day and we listened to it and she was weeping for me uh, thinking about what it was what it must be like to be me yeah and to have been a poster child and to be like seen on the silver screen and to like be playing the role that anybody needed me to play but not being able to play my role, my own role. and so to be able to come here right now and to be able to creation is just mind-boggling mm -hmm. i love being able to see things 10,000 foot 
peek right out the window gives me more life than anything. Yeah. And so to be surrounded by friends and acquaintances and to be meeting new people and not being able to, or not trying to strive towards something, but really being myself and people coming up to me and talking to me, like it's, it's really great. And that's a lot to process and to think about for me and for other people to hear, for you to hear. Like, I don't know what you want to ask me from there, but right. I feel like I'm in a really good place both for myself and with my wife and family. Congratulations. I mean, that's awesome. Thanks. Envious. Uh, <laughs> Number four. Yeah. Uh, with, with that, like, if you were to be able to talk to yourself like five years ago, what would you, like, how would you like slap yourself in the face and say like, you've got to know this. Like, you've got to do this. Like, what would that be? I've thought about it for the four-year-old. And I think there's grace that you give to yourself. As you're thinking, like, I would, and I still probably need to hear it. Yeah. Like, I would slap myself in the face. And I would literally say, like, you, you need to, like, be okay. Like, get over, like, this, like, be graceful to yourself. Like, that's, that's what I still need to hear because I just beat the shit out of myself on the inside. Yeah. But I think look at being that we're wired similarly, you know, being on that level. Um, it's such, I think what, this is not an Enneagram sales channel, but I, I think it's the best, I, your wife is amazing because I think what's so phenomenal with the Enneagram is if you really understand it and then you understand, like it, it should give you this understanding of people and understanding of like, not not being not being upset at them for who they are, but yeah. now it's like being graceful, be like, oh, you are like hurting, yeah. and things that you're doing are because you're hurting. Yeah. And so then being able to like be compassionate, it's like what a what a cool thing that your wife was able to get that. I think it's been such a gift. I think that what I would say to myself then is that you're worthy. You're worth it. Like, whatever happens, whatever has happened, you're worthy of being loved. And uh, emotional as it makes me to think about that. Like, I, I need to hear that. I need to understand that. And I think one, that's one of the things that I've learned. So I heard yesterday that some people were going to go on a boat. I was like, I really love to go on a boat. Nobody's going to ask me to go on a boat. This is a story from a long time ago, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, whatever, you know, less than 30. And I was shamed by my parents, sorry, who are watching this. I was shamed into thinking that my desires were not valid because, because I didn't know how to deal with them. Like I didn't know how to have a desire and to say that I had a desire. Like I wanted to go to my friend's house and play. How do you get to your friend's house when you're in third grade? If they don't ask you. Yeah. You have to ask. And maybe there was a different way that I could have gotten to my friend's house. But I remember calling my friend on the phone and saying, hey, could you talk to your parents and ask if I can come over? And my mom walked in the door, I hung up the phone, she said, what are you doing? I was like, no, no, I wasn't doing anything. But that was not the only time that happened. Right. And, and, and so yesterday I went up to somebody, which opened up a great dialogue uh, of conversation. But I said, hey, I hear you guys are going on a boat ride. Is there any way I could come? And she said, absolutely. Right. And so one of the things that I had learned is that if I have a desire, like you should not just act on any desire that you have, but if you have a valid desire or a thought, like I would love to be included on this, how is somebody going to know that you want to be included on this if you don't let them know? Mm -hmm. Which was affirmed last night when I was talking to a publisher of a magazine that I said, I would love to do something with you. And she said, that's awesome because I don't know who wants to do anything with me. Oh, yeah. Like, we should have a magazine. Everybody wants, I didn't say this. Everybody right. wants to do something with you. She's like, unless somebody tells me I don't know. Yeah. I don't assume that anybody wants, yeah. like, I, thank you for telling me. I would love to do something with you. And so those couple of things have helped me to see, you have a desire, make it known to somebody. I want people to call me. I have the ability to call them myself. Myself, not myself. I have the ability to call my buddy whose birthday was the other day and say, hey, I was just thinking about you and wanted to wish you a happy birthday. Not because I need anything from him, but because I was actually thinking about him and wanted to wish him a happy birthday. 
And I called him and I said that and he wrote me back and he's like, thank you for calling me and leaving me a voicemail and saying that. Like that was huge mm -hmm. for him to get from me. And I, you know, as, as I look back at myself, I've done a lot of things to get something in return. And maybe that's a three, maybe that's a two, maybe that, whatever that is, like that has happened in my life. Like I do something for you and I expect you to do something back for me. That's, that's the unspoken thing. Like each, each number on the Enneagram, this has become the Enneagram episode, but each number on the Enneagram has its own deadly sin. And as a three or even the helper, what happens is you're doing these things which are very nice to other people. You're actually like loving them, taking care of them. But there's this like subconscious thing where you are doing it so that they will love you. And I have done so much in my life so that they yeah. will love me. Even with my wife, even with my kids. Oh yeah, you serve it. But then the bummer is then there's an undercurrent of resentment when you don't get in return what you're hoping to get from the things that you're doing when you're not even realizing you're doing those things to ask for that and why you're resentful, but you're resentful. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a really interesting thing to be like, oh, I'm actually, that act isn't necessarily that loving because you really are only doing it so that they'll love you. Yeah. So that can go toward like, is the gift... Not speaking from is, experience is, or anything. Right. <laughs> is the gift that you're giving to somebody for the giver or for the receiver? Right. Like, I want to give you a gift. Am I giving you something out of selfish desire or something that you truly want or need? Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to, to think about. And so, what you know, whether the, it's the Enneagram podcast or whether it's yeah. whatever it is, like it's been hugely helpful and beneficial for me. I was talking to my wife the other day. Somebody posted on Instagram, like, "What are you going to get out of? What do you want to get out of this week? Like, what do you want to do?" And my wife was like, "Ask questions. Like, yeah. Talk to people. Yeah. Like, don't don't talk too much about yourself." but talk enough to like prompt something from them. Mm -hmm. And this conversation that I had with this person yesterday at lunch about who I was and where I was, and why I was asking to be involved in this boat ride made way for us to have a great conversation for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I was able to walk away. I didn't overshare. She didn't overshare. But then she texted me today and she's like, what was that thing you were telling me about yesterday? And I think that that's really cool to be able to drop little hints yeah. of something without dropping a bomb for people to, to think about and to engage with. And that is my desire is to um, share my story with people, share useful things for me, and not sell people on something that isn't beneficial for me. It's not a multi-level marketing scheme. It's not a sales thing. It's like I get no benefit. I get, I get a little bit of pleasure when people start to understand themselves again, but like, I don't get anything. Out of it. Yeah. And that is a, is a gift that I can give. That is the beginning of me understanding how to give gifts and not to, and, and to not do things only so that I get something back. Yeah. That makes sense. It makes sense. So total sense. That's where I'm at and what I've learned. And that wasn't even like really specific about things that have happened to me or not. Happened to me. Right. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's it's such an important thing. Like for anyone listening that's in a creative space, I, I think that I, I've had a lot of conversations with people on this trip or just in general, just about like this element of you get to a level of sort of success. And so it's like, what's from there? And then you get to a place like I've sort of achieved like the creative goals that I've achieved, but like where what now? And there's this like boredom that kicks in or it's like a self-deprecation, the self like, defeating mentality of never being okay with where you are. So it's, you're, I've, I've had to teach myself and learn how to celebrate little successes along the journey and actually like enjoy the journey versus just the destination, which you're never really gonna ever arrive at. And if you are not allowing yourself to be content in the process and like grateful for the things you've been given and the people that are in your life and the things that you're doing to be able to say like, well, I do like, people would kill to do what I'm doing, you know? and. But if you're not enjoying that or appreciating and being grateful for that place, it is a miserable, miserable place. Yeah. And, I, and I've lived there for years yeah. well, and, it's, and it's bad. And so that conversation is like that challenge for like anyone, like the whole reason that I could do any of these things is so that other people listening and watching can like hear stories from people maybe that they look up to that like, You've, you've got to get over that stuff because it will kill you. Yeah. When I first got married and was having conversations with my wife, 
people are like, where do you want to be in 10 years? And I can tell them where I wanted to be, but I had no idea how I would get there. Mm-hmm. I had no idea what the steps were to get there. I would just say, I want to be able to run a marathon. I want to be a deacon in my church. I want to be an elder. I want to own a bookshop. I want to own a coffee shop. Like whatever it is. I want to shoot. Yeah. Like, I didn't know the steps that it would take. And, and my wife was really good at the steps that it would take to get mm, there. That's great. So blessed am I, grateful am I, um, any kind of word that you can put with that, um, lucky, uh, I, whatever it is, I think that I've been given a huge gift in my life. And I, part of marriage is being able to learn from one another. And she has helped me, uh, helped me make those steps, but also helped me see what those steps are that I'm going to take. Yeah. And so I've been able the last few years to actually see for myself and take ownership for myself what, beginning to understand what those steps are that I need to take to get to the goals that I have. Yeah. I could just see goals and be like, yep, I'm going to do it now. Going to go run a marathon. I graduated from college. as a, I was a D1 athlete in college. Four months after I graduated, I was like, I'm going to buy a bike and go ride 200 miles. Trained a couple times, went and rode 200 miles. A couple months later, I was like, I'm going to run a marathon. So I ran a marathon. My longest run before a marathon was 13.1 miles. And without, with minimal training, I ran a marathon in four hours and 15 minutes. The next year I was like, I'm gonna run a half marathon. I didn't train at all. I just went and ran a half marathon. And my buddy was so mad at me because I ran the entire thing except the last quarter mile with him and he like bolted. Yeah. Because he had trained really hard. Right. And I hadn't trained really hard. Now I understand the importance of training really hard to be able to follow through. Yeah. This morning I ran four and a half miles. It's like, this sounds fun. I'm not self-motivated enough to go run four and a half miles. Sounds miserable. It go was on. miserable. I'm just kidding. But it go was on. kind of fun. To feel. Yeah. I, I, I felt really good after the fact. Yeah. I'm like, I ran four and a half miles. Well, I ran an 8K today. Like, that's pretty awesome. So uh, I need people around me. I need to surround myself with people that are different than me. Yeah. And I've been able to see that. I need that. I want that but not take advantage of that. Yeah. And that's been part of the last few months of my journey, which has been really cool and led me here. Dude. Yeah. Well, I have to have been able to talk to you about all of this. Yeah, man. Well, thanks so much for sharing. And hopefully for anyone that was watching, like Eric Kelly, you can check you out at, at Eric Kelly on Instagram. Is Eric, Eric Kelly. Kelly. Except my Facebook. Um, I didn't Eric with think, a C. I didn't Eric have the a forethought K. to get yeah. Eric Kelly on Facebook. So I'm Eric Daniel Kelly for my personal and Eric right. Kelly Photography. I don't there have you go. Eric Kelly. Some random does. Yeah. But. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Absolutely. And again, if you liked this video, you can look, subscribe below, share it with some friends, check him out. His work is just phenomenal, a good dude. And be graceful to yourself because that if, if we, I could impart anything to anyone that's listening, that is what you need to hear is enjoy the journey and be graceful to yourself on the way because you'll get there eventually. You just got to keep on doing and trucking along. And Slow plot is okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and be okay with that process. Yeah. But yeah. But thanks so much. Yeah. That was a loud five. <laughs>